Okay, okay. Fulfilled Bible prophecies. This is our final, our, our final installment in this series. We're going to take a look at where the Bible has actually said, hey, this is going to happen in the future, and then it actually did. And so um, that's always fun and exciting. Now, uh, hopefully I can remember my slide cues, and I look like too much of a bumbling idiot up here. So let's just check it out. Um, we'll make sure I throw some good recognition. Uh, a lot of what I've covered in this series I stole from Mike Winger, um, good guy, pastor teacher out of California. Um, so check out his YouTube channel. Good guy, Mike Winger. Um, tonight we're looking at Daniel chapter 9 and uh, God's timing. Right, we've been talking a lot about different things where it was saying that the Messiah would come and what Messiah would do, but Daniel actually gives us a timeline of when that is going to happen. Like he actually says, okay, starting from this point, this many years to that point, that's when it's going to happen. So we're actually going to get to look to see how the Bible lines that out. Okay, so let's just jump on in to Daniel chapter 9. Um, at this point, uh, Daniel knows that the uh, exile, the end, is going to be coming soon. Um, he uh, has Jeremiah's writings, and so he knows 70 years and everything. So he's praying on behalf of Israel, praying for the people. And uh, while he is praying about that, uh, an angel comes and gives him this vision, gives him this um, revelation. Starting in verse 24, I believe, is, yeah, 24 is where we start. It says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Okay, so, so now he's saying, okay, in 70 weeks, here's what's going to happen. That transgression will be finished. We're going to put an end to sin. That there's going to be reconciliation for iniquity, for, for the evil, for the transgressions, for the sin. Reconciliation is going to be made and the most holy will be anointed. So that's a reference to the Messiah. So he's saying in 70 weeks... We're going to see this happen, and that is quite, I think, obviously describing New Testament theology, reconciliation of sin, forgiveness of sin, um, and all of that. And we're given this time period of 70 weeks. And then in verse 25, it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, and the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. And so here we actually are getting some details of what we are going to look at. It says that from the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Okay, so there's going to be a command, and that command is going to be a starting point, and um, from there, uh, it'll be restore and build Jerusalem, and the street will be built again, the wall will be built, and that this command to do these things is going to set off the, time, uh, the timeline, the countdown, the clock, for when Messiah will come. So I said that there is going to be, from this command until Messiah comes, there's going to be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Okay, so there we get our kind of first look at our timeline. We'll take some closer looks here in a little bit. Verse 26, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. An end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. And so he's saying that at the end of this 62 weeks, 
which is actually 69 because you have the 7 and then 62. At the end of the 69th week, Messiah gets cut off. That, that term cut off, we've looked at it before, where it's used in scripture, it's actually like a, a reference to a judicial execution. That this is someone being cut off from the land of the living, but not just killed, but killed in a judicial fashion. This is penalty for crime. So Messiah is going to get killed. There's going to be a death sentence, but not for himself. That sounds familiar. And then it says that the city and the temple are going to be destroyed by these people who are to come. Right? They're not known yet. Daniel does not know this kingdom, doesn't know this prince, doesn't know these people. But they're going to come, and those will be the people who will destroy the temple and the city. Okay? Now, it, then in verse 27, we're not going to look at We're going to stop here in 26. Verse 27 starts to get into the 70th week. Right? And y'all have studied some end time stuff enough to know that that's, that's a future. That's actually referring to things that in our time has not happened yet. But the first 69 weeks have. And that's what we're going to take a look at. So we have this nice handy dandy timeline where the, um, the, the, the time is going to be kicked off by some command. Right? Someone is going to give a command, a decree for the city to be rebuilt. And then you have seven weeks plus 62 weeks. And then that's when Messiah comes. Messiah gets cut off. And then sometime after that, around that time, uh, the city and the temple get destroyed again. And so this is one reason why we know that the 70th week is future. Because the 70th week has a temple rebuilt. Well, you know, it has to be destroyed before it can be rebuilt. And so that's how we know that this was... Uh, that's why we believe there's that pause between 69 and 70. But that's a whole other, whole other lesson. Okay. Here's the thing. He keeps talking about weeks. But how long is a week? Because this doesn't seem to be making sense. He's saying that this stuff's going to happen in a few weeks. Well, if you're counting from Daniel's time, right? If you're counting, okay, there's going to be this command. And then within 70 weeks, all this is going to happen and take place. That doesn't really seem to match up, especially when you consider that the events of uh, the last week are massive. So let's take a look at what is meant by weeks. That word for week is actually the Hebrew word shabua, which I'm probably not pronouncing right. But um, it literally just means a grouping of seven. Kind of the English version of this that no one ever knows because we don't use it, unless you're like an academic and like to use big words to impress people, is a heptad. A heptad is just a grouping of seven. Kind of like the way we use the word dozen. A dozen is just 12. Like you can have a dozen eggs, a dozen roses. Well, you can have a heptad of anything. A week is a heptad of seven days. You can have a, a, a heptad of seven, you know, uh, whatever, hamburgers. You can have seven, you know, of anything. You just name it. In this case, the week, which really isn't a seven-day week, it's a heptad, is a grouping of seven, appears to be uh, years. Now, that's not just me saying that because it happens to look good for Christianity, yay for Team Jesus, but um, there's real reasons to look at this. In Daniel chapter 9, he's um, talking about, he, you know, he's, he's looking at the exile, he's thinking about the exile, he's praying about the exile. Well, the exile has to do with this idea of a Sabbath rest for the land. That there's a grouping of seven for the land. Second Chronicles uh, describes it this way. Uh, it says, uh, To those who escaped from the sword carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. Remember, the word of the Lord that Jeremiah spoke was about the exile. Right? Jeremiah was warning, it's coming, it's going to happen. It says, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. So you have a, a Sabbath is that seventh year of rest. But now we're talking years 
not days. Normally we think of the Sabbath, it's, you know, that seventh day of rest. Well, this is a seventh year of rest. The actual command they're referring to is in Leviticus 25.4. It says, in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land. A Sabbath to the Lord, you shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. So the Israelites had not been keeping that Sabbath rest for the land since um, probably going back to the time, if you do the math, it's about the time of David or Solomon, right about whenever everything took a downward turn and they stopped following God, they stopped observing the Sabbath rest for the land. And so you do the math on that and you come up with 490 years of not keeping that Sabbath, that comes out to 70 Sabbaths. And that's why God sent them into exile for 70 years. You wouldn't give the land its rest? Fine. I will, by kicking you out. And now you're not here to work the land that gets its rest. And so for 70 years, while the Jews are in exile, the land is basically getting its Sabbath rest. So that's kind of why the exile was 70 years. Uh, but even more than that, in Daniel chapter 12, Daniel is talking about the 70th week. Now we're not going to get into details of that, but he says this in Daniel 12:11. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, and from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Now, if a week is just a week of seven days, how do you get 1,290 days inside of seven days? You don't. The seven has to be something else. Revelation 11 and 12, also describing um, the 70th week, is this talking about a seven year period that is cut in half, three and a half years. And so if the 70th week is seven years, then it makes sense that the other 69 weeks are also referring to years. Make sense? Right? Got a couple of almost skeptical looking eyebrows. I'm like, okay, we're good? Questions? Right? Okay. All right, so what does that do to our timeline? If we got 69 weeks of years, so we're actually talking about years, times 69 times 7, 483 years. So there's going to be a command, 483 years, and that is when Messiah is going to come. So what's the question we have now? What do we need to know? When does the command happen? Right? Do we know when this command is issued? Do we actually have something in scripture that says, here, from this point, go forward? Well, we've got a few candidates, if you will. You have Cyrus in 539 BC. He gives a, a decree for some people to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild some stuff. Artaxerxes in 457, and then again in 444, he gives two different commands for people to return to Jerusalem and build some stuff. Uh, some people will point at Darius. There's one point where Darius gives a command, but really he came across Cyrus's command and went, hey, uh, did this happen? Hey, hey guys, go do this, right? He's looking at a decree from a former king and wanting to make sure it got done. So it's not really its own command. It just refers back to number one. So those are our candidates. So we got to see, do any of these actually fit the prophecy? Okay, um, Cyrus the Great, if you want to open to Ezra chapter 1, you can, but I'm going to go ahead and read this. So in 539, uh, Ezra records, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord of God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of that place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock besides the freewill offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Okay, so Cyrus is saying, hey, you know, go, go build the temple. 
right? He's saying, build God a house, which is in Jerusalem. Well, what's a house of God? It's the temple. So he's commanding that they return. Hey, Jews, you can go home, go home, yeah, have some money, have some stuff, go back and build a temple to your God. Okay, well, here's the thing. In Daniel 9, what's the command supposed to be? A command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. The street shall be built again and the wall. Well, that's talking about the city, not the temple. And Cyrus's command was to build the temple. He didn't say anything about the city. So that one doesn't seem to pass uh, the test. And we know that at that time in um, 539 BC and the immediate future decades going forward, the city was not rebuilt. So not only does the command not say to build the city, we know from history it didn't get done anyway. Okay, so I think we can cross that one off. So now we have this first command from Artaxerxes in 457 BC. So almost a century later. And he says, I'm not going to read it. It's in Ezra 7. It's a... Uh, verses 11 to 28. That's a long passage. You can go read that if you want. Um, but again, he doesn't specifically mention the city. He only says, go back and build the temple. So he gives this command to go build the temple. And so uh, they do a lot of work on the temple. Temple gets some work. What's interesting though is unlike the first command in this one, even though he does not specifically mention the city, we do know that in the decades that follow, the city does get built. So some scholars say, well, a command was given and people went back and the city got rebuilt. So this might be it, even though the command doesn't specifically say it. Some people say, hey, this is it. This one's a contender. This one might be it. So let's take a look. We have the command in 457 plus 483 years, if you do the math on that, you get about 26 or 27 AD. Because if you go and you look in Ezra, it says, in the first year of the reign of Artaxerxes, which it could be 457 or 456, whichever, you do the math, you get 26 or 27 AD. What events took place in 26 or 27 AD? Well, a lot of scholars, depending on how they date some of the events in the Bible, some people say that's around the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Hmm. Well, that might work. And we know for sure, even if you, which I tend to think Jesus really probably got his start in 29 or 30, um, but that's a whole other issue. But even if you think, okay, it wasn't exactly when Jesus began his ministry, it's when John the Baptist began his, who was the forerunner for the coming of the Messiah. So that actually fits the timeline. Hey, Messiah is gonna come. At least the forerunner. So, so this one, it, it, it at least is getting in that time frame where it's looking like this could be fitting with Jesus, okay? So that, that, that's a contender. That's a possibility that has some promise. But then we have this other command. And this one, this is the one most folks know about. In 444, you get a command from Artaxerxes to Nehemiah. We get this in uh, Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah was hearing reports and he was hearing things about Jerusalem and just, you know, the city of his forefathers sitting empty and in ruin and the temple was kind of shabby and the walls are torn down and he just, it's really weighing him down to the point that the king noticed and asks him, hey, Nehemiah, what's going on? Why do you look so sad? Right? I mean, we'll paraphrase, but that's basically what happened. Um, and so uh, Nehemiah tells him, oh, well, you know, I'm just, I'm feeling really down because the city of my forefathers are, is, is in ruins and it hasn't been rebuilt. The people haven't gone back and resettled. And the king, starting in verse four, the king said to me, what do you request? I mean, that's gotta be pretty cool. You're just kind of sitting there feeling down. The king, you know, emperor, most powerful person probably on the planet at that time says, hey man, what's wrong? 
And you tell him, and he goes, what can I do for you? That, that's got to be nice. So I prayed to God, and then I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. And then the king said to me, and the queen also, sitting beside him, how long will your journey be, and when will you return? And so it pleased the king to send me, <clears throat> no, what's the place? Pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. So he's like, ooh, ooh, he's gonna let me go. He's gonna let me go do it. Uh, yeah, I should be gone this long. Furthermore, feeling brave, Nehemiah adds some on. If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And let a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Okay, so Nehemiah makes these requests and the king says, yes, so shall it be done. Well, what are the requests? That he gets to go to Judah and re build Jerusalem. And he specifically mentions the walls. I, I didn't yeah, see the word. So um, specifically says, hey, and, and, and can I go to tell your guy who manages your forest that I need timber to rebuild the walls? And the king says, yeah, go for it. So it specifically is mentioning rebuilding the city and rebuilding the walls. Well, Daniel 9.25 what is it that it said the command is going to be? The command will be to restore and rebuild Jerusalem and the street and the wall shall be built. This looks like the command. This looks like the decree from the king to go and rebuild the city. Okay, so let's look at our timeline. I changed this around a little bit right before class. Let's see if I can remember what I did. Okay, so you have the command. And then you have, this is what's really interesting. I love this part. If you go and look in the historian Josephus, Josephus says that the city of Jerusalem was rebuilt for, from this time period. Nehemiah goes to rebuild the city. The, re, the city was rebuilt within 49 years. 49 years? What's that divided by seven? That's seven. Hey, that's seven weeks. You ever wondered why in that prophecy when it says there will be seven weeks and then there will be 62 weeks? It seems quite plain to me that the seven weeks was the rebuilding of the city. Yay, the Jews have returned, the city's rebuilt, the temple is built. And what's really interesting is if you work out the timeline, at the end of that seven weeks is also right around the time that Malachi, the last prophet writing in the Old Testament, finished his book. And then that 62 weeks is the intertestament period of silence where there was no message from God and they were just waiting for Messiah to come. All right. Okay. So let's do our math. We have the command from Artaxerxes in 444. And then we have I mean, that command that looks like it's it. And we got the 483 years, which is going to give us 38 AD. Hold on a second. What's going on in 38 AD? I mean, there's some church stuff going on, but Jesus, he's coming left. Okay, something appears to be off. Got a glare there. I can't really see what I'm doing. All right, here's what we got to ask, though. It says it's 483 years. How long is a year? Now, we know how long a year is, right? 365 days. If you want to get specific, it's actually 365 days, um, 5 hours, 48 minutes, 45.975 seconds. That's how long it takes for the, you know, rotation. <clears throat> or for, uh, you know, to get around the sun. Well, but is that how long 
it was in ancient time. How long were their years back then? How did they count that? We actually have pretty good evidence that a lot of ancient civilizations did not consider their years 365 days. <clears throat> Many actually considered it 360 days. 12 months with 30 days per month. We have all these weird, you know, you have to learn the thing on your knuckles. Did y'all learn that? January, February, March, you know, right? It, where, where, it, they didn't have all that. It's just, they were all 30. Okay, well, we have these other civilizations, um, India, Persia, Babylon, Assyria, Egypt, even civilizations, Central, South America, and China, they all use this 360-day measurement. Well, that's interesting. But we're not talking about them. We're talking about the Bible. So what does the Bible use? What did the Hebrews use? What did the Israelites use? If you go to Genesis chapter 7, the story of the flood, <clears throat> It tells you when the flood begins and when the flood ends. It says in the 600th year of Noah's life, <clears throat> in the second month, the 17th day, so it's getting very specific, second month, 17th day, on that day all the fountains of the deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. That's when the flood started. 17th day of the second month. When did it end? Well, in Genesis chapter 8, says the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased and the ark rested on the seventh month, the 17th day of the month on the mountains of Ararat. So we have 150 days. It tells us that it lasted 150 days. And it tells us that it began on the second month, ended on the seventh month. What's that, five months, right? Okay, now we gotta do a little math. 150 days, five months, that's 30 days per month. 17th to the 17th, 30 days per month. Okay. If you total that up, you get a 360-day year. Well, that's Genesis. All right. Let's go to Revelation, chapter 11. <clears throat> this is talking about the, uh, the, the witnesses. Right, the, the, the two prophets, the two witnesses that come and prophesy and they're performing miracles and, you know, and have the fire and, you know, calling out and just, you know, those guys. And they are there, it says, <clears throat> they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. And I will give power to my witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days. So we're actually in the same verse, given two different time periods for how long these guys are going to be ministering and prophesying in Jerusalem. 42 months or 1,260 days. Well, 1,260 days divided by 42 is 30 days per month, okay? Three and a half years, right? And, and, and we've done some end time studies, so you're all familiar with these guys. So you know that this event that it's referring to is actually part of Daniel's seventh week. Okay, well, if the uh, seven or 70th week, if the 70th week is 360 days, wouldn't it make sense the other 69 would be 360 days per year? Seems to make sense to me. All right. Um, we also have some more in Revelation. Or did I just copy? I think it was just a copy. Somehow I got a double in there. All right, let's get to our timeline. Okay, 483 years. But they're not 365 day years. We need to count days, not years. So 483 years times 360 days is 173,000 880 days. Well, now we've got a problem. If we're going to count days, what day do we start on? I'm not going to go into the details, but the fun thing here is March 5th. In the book of Nehemiah, if you look at the clues that are in the text, whenever he says that he turned and asked the king, hey, can I go rebuild the city? He gives you what month it was. And then if you look at some other things that happen, you can calculate which day it was that he actually asked, that made that request of the king. So we know when the decree went out, 
was March 5th, 444 BC. So we have our day. Now we can add 173,880 days, which gets us to March 30th of 33 AD. Hey, what was going on on March 30th in 33 AD? Not only, well, it's not quite the crucifixion. Not only is it the life of Jesus, it is Holy Week. Depending on, because I actually saw a couple different sources. Uh, one scholar I saw that totaled this up put March 30th as the triumphal entry. I don't know if I buy that one. It appears to actually be Monday, not Palm Sunday. But either way, it's bam, it nails Holy Week. The last week of Jesus, his ministry, his arrival in and declaration, here I am, I am the king, before he is crucified. That looks pretty convincing to me. I mean, you don't get, you want to talk about specific prophecy. From the time of that command, 483 years to the coming of Messiah, you date the command, you do the math, you get the week that Jesus walks into Jerusalem, declares himself king, and gets crucified. You don't get much more specific than that. So, let's review about what exactly it was the prophecy foretold was going to happen. It says that the city would be rebuilt. Well, first there'd be a command to rebuild. Now remember, Daniel was writing in 538 B.C., that's like the, the, the last end date. You know, you ask when it was Daniel written. It's probably written over many, many years. But that's probably by the time it was finished. So Daniel, written in 538 B.C. He says that the command will be given to rebuild the city. That command doesn't come until almost 100 years later. But he knew it was coming. The city actually gets rebuilt. We learn, we know when that happened. Josephus tells it it was 396 BC. Daniel knew that was going to happen. The timing of Jesus coming, right? We just got that down. Depending on which command you go by, you're either getting the beginning of his ministry or the end of it. That seems pretty clear there. It talks about Messiah's sacrificial death for others, that he will be cut off but not for himself. Well, that's exactly what Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 tells us. And they're pointing to the life and the events, the crucifixion of Jesus. He tells us that the city and the temple will be destroyed and that by a people not yet known. That's Rome. Daniel didn't know Rome. He didn't know who Rome was, but they came and that's who destroyed the temple. It happened almost 600 years after Daniel wrote that prophecy, but it is fulfilled, historically verifiable, down to the dates when these things were to happen. So there we go on that one. Now, now here's something that's kind of fun. This is interesting. We look at this and, and, and critics will say this, but like, okay, I see what you're saying, but I mean, surely the Jews would have noticed this. I mean, if it was this simple, this plain, this specific, shouldn't the Jews have seen it? Well, then exactly what Jesus said, basically, oh, Jerusalem, you who should have known the hour of your visitation, but you didn't. And actually, the Old Testament prophesies that when Messiah comes, he'll be rejected. So the Jews not seeing it actually is fulfilling prophecy. And the, this, is, the, this is interesting. If you go to the Talmud, the Talmud is the commentaries, teachings, writings of rabbis, authoritative scholars, teachers of the Jews. There's something that happened in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. The Jews shifted from being a sacrifice temple-focused religion 
and Judaism became what's called rabbinic Judaism, where it is all about uh, good works and just trying to follow the law as close as you can. And so they have what's called the Talmud. It's uh, the writings of rabbis who are revered, respected, considered authoritative. And so um, you don't just have the scripture, you have this, and these guys tell you how to live, how to fulfill what the scripture says. So the Talmud is very important. After the time of Christ, rabbis actually pronounced a curse on anyone who would try to calculate the dates of Daniel 9. This is from the Talmud Sanhedrin, um, in a part that is a commentary on Daniel chapter 9. It says, blasted be the bones of those who calculate the end. Another section that says, all the predestined dates for redemption have passed and the matter now depends only on repentance and good deeds. Stop looking for Messiah. You're not even allowed to calculate it. A curse be upon you if you try. Now it's just repent and try to be good. Wow. That says a lot. Because Jesus was the Messiah. They, they know. They know when Messiah was supposed to come. And they rejected Jesus, so who else is it? There is no one else who's a candidate. But the time's passed. So what do they do? They just close the door. Don't, don't look over there. Don't, don't worry about that. Let's just be good. Let's just follow the teachings of Moses and the prophets and try to be good. Don't worry about that Messiah stuff. So questions, comments, thoughts? Well, this, this concludes our study of prophecy. So let's kind of end it off with a uh, recap. We looked at Daniel chapter 7 and 8, which again was written in 538 BC. And they foretold of the coming of Alexander the Great 200 years later, of his kingdom being split into four, and the later rise of Antiochus IV in 175 BC the little horn that came out of one of the four horns. All laid out in detail in Daniel 7 and 8. We looked at Ezekiel 26, which was written in 565 BC, and it tells us about the destruction of Tyre over 200 years before it happens in specific detail. We looked at Psalm 22, written a thousand years before Jesus, but it describes to us the crucifixion of the Messiah, which crucifixion is not invented until 400 BC by the Persians. But the type of crucifixion that the Messiah suffers will be perfected by the Romans in the time of Christ. And it gives detail. In Isaiah 53, we're told about the suffering servant, which describes Jesus perfectly 700 years before he actually came. And then we look at Daniel 9, where we get the timing of Messiah and the destruction of the temple. Again, almost 600 years before those events would come to pass. In detail, this isn't some vague, oh, maybe it's this. We can kind of shape things and imagine this. No. You, you, we've seen every step of the way in every one of these. It is specific that God, that's one of the great things about the Bible. that We can say the Bible is the word of God because in order to be the word of God, it would have to contain things that no human mind can know. Where God says this is going to happen in detail and then it does happen just as it was said. And not only are we given some detail, but we're actually given specific dates and timelines. Things that you can't say, oh, well, you know, they just kind of made that up to match and maybe this is that. All right, we, we looked at the profile of the Messiah. We went through like two dozen different things that the Bible says the Messiah will be. And Jesus fit them all 
And that all comes from the Old Testament, which was finished 400 years before Jesus came along. Over and over again, as we've seen, the Bible contains messages, contains prophecy, contains information that could not come from the mind of men, which stands as evidence that it is indeed the Word of God. Okay, last chance. Comments, questions? So after this, we're done, so we'll never talk about it ever again. No. Um, next week, now next week, um, we're, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to be studying cults. We're going to take a look at, um, you know, uh, not, not just cults in general, but specifically ones that claim to be branches of Christianity and the way they twist and um, look at uh, Christianity and how they can be a draw away from that into heresy. And so we're going to take a look at that. Um, it's not going to be me standing here teaching. It's going to be a DVD-based series. Um, so if you're any of the people who have been viewing this online, like if you missed and then you're able to catch up because we've been posting these, um, this won't be getting posted. I'm sure there's copyright reasons why we shouldn't be able to do that um, because it's someone else's material rather than me teaching it. Um, and so you'll have to be here to watch the video and engage in the discussions. But that's starting next week, and I believe it's a six-week study. So, all right. This is the end.